Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this first session in our webinar series this week, the state of the industry. Um, so I can see people are still coming in, but we've just got housekeeping and introductions at the beginning. So uh, hopefully more people will arrive by the time we really dive into the depth of it. So today is the first session of three, and we're looking at the situation, strategies, and changing priorities across the telecoms industry. So just to give you a quick agenda for the day, we're gonna do some introductions of the series and of the panel that we have today. Uh, then we're gonna have a little bit of a presentation on some of the, the results from our survey that we've run on priorities in telecoms investment. Then we're gonna have a more open discussion for um, telecoms priorities and obviously hear from, from Reiner, who, who's very close to figuring out how to prioritize um, for Chilia. And uh, we'll be opening to questions from the audience. So as you think of your questions, as they come along based on what we're discussing, do send them in. We're planning to have a really open discussion. You know, the idea is we've all missed out on more Mobile World Congress. We've missed on some nice conversations, you know, really thinking about what's happening in the industry and, and you know, where is it going? And so the point is to keep this relatively informal. So we'll take your questions as we go along. Uh, so a quick, Introduction, starting with housekeeping. You'll see that uh, you all have a control panel here. Um, you guys are all uh, on mute. Well, not the panel, but everyone in the audience, you're on mute. Um, if you need us for any reason, please use the chat box um, and we'll help you in any way we can. Although uh, sometimes technical difficulties, there is a limit of what we can do during the session, but we are recording it. So if anything happens, you'll be able to catch up on it later. And we will also share the slides from the recording afterwards. We'll send that out in an email to everyone. So I think that's it for housekeeping. And the next thing is just to give you a, a heads up on the full webinar series in case you guys are not familiar with it. But we're doing three days where we're thinking about some of the really big topics that are on our minds in the telecoms industry. So obviously for today, we're thinking about, you know, how our investment priorities changing, what's top of mind for telecoms operators and, and you know, what are they hoping to achieve in 2021 and beyond. Then tomorrow, I will be moderating a session uh, looking at what are the best new growth opportunities. So trying to understand how do you identify those opportunities and prioritize them? How do you scale them? All those tough things about bringing those ideas to life. So that'll be tomorrow. And then finally on Thursday, my colleague Dahlia, um, a principal consultant and lead of our EDGE practice, will be hosting a panel looking at 5G, EDGE and cloud ecosystems. You know, thinking about how we bring those particular opportunities and platforms to life. So if you haven't registered for the others, then you're more than welcome to. We'll be recording those the same as this one and you know, try to keep those a lively discussion as well. So without further ado, let's get started on today's session. Um, I'll just say, you know, I'm a principal analyst at STL Partners and we'll be joining today's panel um, to some degree, talking about healthcare and some other areas that I'm interested in. Um, but our, our star of the show today is uh, Reiner. So let me hand over to you for an introduction, please. Thanks, uh, Amy. What a pleasure to be back here. Uh, we had a few good sessions uh, over the past even years. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, look forward to the session uh, and the heated discussion. I think uh, with Dean, it's never uh, getting boring. So uh, that, will be, that will be no problem. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, have recently onboarded uh, a Telia company. Um, since actually half a year running um, as a chief operating officer, what is called uh, the delivery side. So we have an integrated network across all our six markets. We have an integrated IT across uh, all six markets. We have integrated products, um, security, service assurance, um, analytics, uh, and so on. So these are the things that we are doing um, across the markets to really get the best scale uh, and efficiency um, and quality. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, in the Nordics. Uh, I come from far away uh, in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, where I've been running as a Group Chief Operating Officer in, uh, in Axiata at uh, Sri Lanka. And previously I was uh, helping to build uh, Reliance Geo in India between 2014 and 2017 to build and scale up um, that company that is now the number one, uh, obviously in the market with about 400 million customers as we, as we speak. 
Um, so that's my my background. Earlier, I was uh, I was here obviously in, in Europe uh, with uh, Deutsche Telekom also running products. So that's kind of the tour across across the world. Now being back closer to to home. Good to be here. Great, thank you so much, Reiner. Next up, we have Dean Bubbly. Hi, uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, Dean Bubbly. So I work with uh, STL as an associate uh, director um, covering uh, network technology. Uh, I also run my own company, Disruptive Analysis, and uh, people will uh, perhaps know me on social media as Disruptive Dean. And I spend a lot of time looking at what's happening with um, wireless technology, spectrum, 5G, Wi-Fi. Um, particularly at the moment, the rise of things like um, private cellular networks, uh, Wi-Fi 6 and the future 7, fixed wireless access and, and related areas. So, yeah, I did some of the scenario planning work um, that went into last year's um, post-COVID uh, analysis as well, uh, wearing my uh, futurist hat uh, on what's happening with long-term trends. Great. Thanks, Thanks Dean. Dean. And finally, Andrew. Hello, I'm Andrew Collins, and I'm research director and one of the partners at STL. Um, I uh, did the research or conducted the research that some of the stuff we're going to share, and I lead our research practice. I'd just like to say, before I forget, which I will at the end, to thank Reiner for his time and Dean for his. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. What I said to them both and Amy is kind of the thing I miss about not having Mobile Congress this year, those conversations you have. Uh, over a coffee and and what do you think what's the temperature what's happening what do you find out you know you get and and so we're trying to recreate that with this webinar series and today's the first one where we've got you know th this great panel and we're looking at priorities today and changing priorities but to do that we're going to need to put that a little bit in perspective so we'll try and get through that pretty quickly so we can get to the meat of discussion um what i said to to reiner is what what a brilliant opportunity this is for us uh, all everyone that's part of the audience uh, to understand how a group chief operating officer is thinking in the current environment and what 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 factors they're taking into account how they're needing to make decisions um to some extent you know how can we help the rhinos of this world make the, the best decisions they can you know how do we need to couch things to them how do we understand what they're thinking about but also um you know there may be some things in here that rhinos looking at and say hey well, this is interesting we're on this but we're not on that but I don't expect him to say that. He's way too way too experienced, <laughs> but you never know. So um, that's kind of where we're aiming to go. So I'm going to try and bang through a few slides quickly and get to the meat of this, which is about some priorities research we've done, but I'll try and put things in context. So Amy, how do I take control of the presentation? I'm just You have control. I think you just click through. Okay, well, let's have a go. Um, I'm not currently... I don't actually have the controls visible to me for some reason, Amy. So just I wonder if you could for temporarily drive the. Yeah, you'll have to go in the bottom left, but for now I will do it okay. for you. Thank you very much. So this is a very quick recap of the thing, and I'll just try and see if I've got this right, Amy. If this works. So these are the things we said back in the summer of 2020. So we said, and we'd been saying this from March to be fair, the the COVID pandemic is not a short term disruption. And oh, no, I pressed the wrong button. There you go. That's the risk of allowing the uneducated to take control of presentation, i.e. me. Um, and we think that was a reasonably good prediction. Um, the next piece is we've said that telcos have done some good things, and we think that's still true. They haven't not done good things. They've kept doing good things, a lot of great stuff uh, in terms of supporting customers. And we also said that it would accelerate existing trends, which we we call the coordination age, uh, the use of technology and information to make better use of resources fundamentally, or on demand and connected technologies to do that. And we said 5G spending may be more cautious based on what we could see and what we thought, and that I think has proved true. But one of the things we'll see when we look at the research is that sentiment is changing. Now, the last two things were slightly more um, questionable I think in terms of whether they're real or not and I think that's part of the meat of the conversation with Reiner and I think there's, there's grounds for optimism but there's also grounds for improvement and one of them here was they should telco should focus their needs or their their attention on new customer needs and I, th I think what they've done really well uh, by and large is is focus on how to migrate um, the current services to a better platform and to better services for the existing customers. So I think they've done a great job of, for the most part, of making the existing stuff work well. 
the bit that I think we're pushing and, and trying to say, hey guys, we think we could be, you'd be doing more of, is looking at new needs because you know there are, there are a bunch of new needs happening quite quickly and there are opportunities there for telcos. And I think the last point was you make it an opportunity to accelerate and embody positive change. And um, again, I think there's a question mark. I think there's definitely been a sense that the telco industry has pulled together hard and, and has worked really well in, in individual operators. Um, the, the thing I think we're pushing for is that this mustn't stop. You know, you've, you've, you've found out you can do things quickly and this is the great experience of COVID. We can change quickly if we want to. And I think that's the great opportunity in a sense. And, and what we're trying to point to is how do we get there and see how we, how we make that happen. And that's our view. So um, what I'd like to do is then just recap and we'll revisit those conclusions as we go through the details. So I'm trying to go through this reasonably quickly. Um, so Dean, what I'll do is I'll, I'll set up this chart and then we'll just talk through the, the sort of movements that we've seen on. So, so what we did back in, in the summer is we created this chart, which looked at what we thought were the appropriate axes for scenarios. So on one axis, you've got so, sort of slow time to recovery. So slow time to get treatments out there, vaccines, effective track and trace and so on to fast on the right hand side. Then you've got collaborative global response on the top. So if things are going together well and everybody's working together well, uh, then you're up that side. And if you're more fragmented and national, because there were times when we were looking at fairly bleak situations, you'd be down here. And we laid out four, or sorry, there's a color scale here, red to, to, to green for these scenarios. So, and they are back to almost normal. So that's what everything going, you know, what we were thinking about maybe in February last year is how long will it take to get back to what the world we knew. Um, there's the fragmented recovery scenario, which is uh, kind of on the way to a much worse one, which is weakened distance, where you have you know, really quite extreme national differences and you know, complete lack of cooperation globally, um, and you know quite quite uh, a dystopian view of the world, I, th I think. And on the plus side, there is a stronger than before, where you know um, people are collaborating effectively and the response is fast and everything's there. And I'm just going to bang on where we thought things were, and I'm going to expand this chart in a minute to make it a bit bigger and you'll understand why. So in February 20, we thought we were there and moving down to the right, to the bottom right hand corner. By July, we were starting to think, yes, our outlook is a little bit more positive, a little bit more um, positive towards the collaborative response and the speed seemed to have speeded up a bit because we were seeing that. Um, actually, I mean, the speed was actually going the wrong direction because we saw early signs of a second wave and we didn't know about therapeutics. And at that point, you know, there was lots of talk about vaccinations, but there was certainly yeah, early trials, but there's certainly nothing that was uh, that was happening. So at that point, we were probably pessimistic about the timing, mm. but m perhaps more optimistic about collaboration. OK, so I think I described the axis wrong. So apologies for that. So, so the axis on going towards the right is it takes longer and going towards the left is it it's quicker that's that's fundamentally the axis we're talking about and so Dean and I had a bit of a shot at this and to do, do where do we think we are today um, we had a bit of a shot of this and I've sort of what you can see is I've moved to see I've zoomed us in zoomed halfway in. to the picture because there's no point in having the weak distance piece because we, we don't seem to be heading towards that so you know imagine we've zoomed in by a factor of two and then putting the existing things back on the chart, you know, they, they look kind of here. So where we thought we feel like it's moving towards is somewhere around here. It feels like things have speeded up, maybe got a little bit more collaborative, but not quite got back to, you know, back to almost normal. It's still a little bit less collaborative and perhaps slower than we'd like, but that's kind of where we got a view. So I'd welcome your the thoughts yeah. on that. Uh, I would say on the terms of the timing, I mean, this, yeah two things going on. obviously the, the overall duration of the pandemic is now looking longer and so people talking about you know recovery certainly economically 2022 2023 you know, you see different countries uh, different paces there um where i think we've accelerated is in some of the treatment side of it and um certainly the early signs of uh, on the vaccinations for example are very positive um compared to where we might have thought nine months ago so i think that's that's certainly improved in terms of collaboration, 
there's moderate levels and i think there's some levels of global coordination there's obviously things like uh covax for example um but at the same time there's obviously you know, different trajectories in different parts of the world and i think that, that one of the things that i think we might end up with and I, whether this directly impacts telecoms as much as other parts of the economy and um, and society i don't know is a sort of low covid world which is sort of australia new zealand vietnam taiwan and a heavily vaccinated world which is sort of the moment is sort of um you know israel uk us parts of europe and, and maybe chile i think it is another um uh, and so you might end up with those two, two poles um which which perhaps put a different complexion on this but in terms of general collaboration on things like technology there seems to be reasonable amount although we've still obviously post us election we've still got um uh the trade uh, issues between the us and china um which don't appear to have changed much with the new administration um and there's also new things we weren't expecting such as um the uh, semiconductor supply chain issues um which are impacting everything from automotive and connected vehicles to potentially some areas of uh, network equipment as well and so i think we need to keep an eye on that thanks dean uh, amy reiner any thoughts i was going first <laughs> yeah i mean i i think that one of the areas that i've been looking at has been healthcare and i'm not sure that you know from a collaboration perspective you know whether that's really what's driving it or just the need but there has been a lot of advances in adoption of digital health and that's that's a positive right it's helping you know it, there have been a lot of barriers to adoption of things like virtual care of things like remote monitoring um you know self-care applications all of those things have been really difficult to get people to use both from from the, the healthcare provider side among doctors and physicians and among patients and a lot of those barriers and regulatory barriers have been lowered and you know that's going to make that's going to you know drastically improve accessibility in emerging markets and you know the the cost um challenges in in developed markets um so you know that's a that's a real positive from my perspective that that's come out of the the pandemic situation yeah and then if i if i look at the industry uh, not only limited to the telco industry, actually, I think what we are seeing, and this has been a theme in our last discussion as well, is the, uh, I would say, bifurcation of winners and losers, uh, those people who are uh, embracing the digital technologies uh, to the advantage of the customers and the internal operations are incrementally stronger coming out of the pandemic, uh, and those people who are slow. Uh, we'll lose customers and we'll lose the uh, competitiveness in the market. So it's, I think, an acceleration of um, trends uh, that we definitely see um, in the market. And um, it is uh, not too late, but it's certainly uh, it's certainly important for all the players to to, to be mindful uh, of the fact that things like uh, you know, providing uh, an, a digital and online way of working uh, with the customers and providing uh, digital an online way of working uh, with the own workforce is, is a competitive advantage now more than ever before. So um, I think that's the, the element I would add to this. So it's a non-linear, I think it's a non-linear development if you look at the players in the marketplace uh, today. That's interesting, thank you. Well, look, I'm, I wanted to get to the consequences of this, but I think the point of this part of the conversation was just to sort of locate our our understanding of where, where we're at and I think it's good that we're roughly in the same place and I would just say to the attendees you know have conversation if you have questions do type them in as we go and because um, Amy and I between us will keep an eye on that and we'll try and respond as as we go so um, okay well what we did um, to move things on from what I view last summer was to look at some industry research so I surveyed about um, I ended up doing about 144 respondents and they were a mixture of operators, vendors and consultants and analysts like us. It's about equally split between those groups. Um, the, uh, the sample was, was biased, I would say, towards Europe and North America, but there were respondents from globally. So and there was probably about 70 percent overall from Europe and um, North America, 25, 30 from 
Asia Pacific and about 10 from Middle East, not many from Latin America. So that was the fundamental geographical split. And the uh, seniority was quite good. I mean, most of them were, I mean, 48% of the respondents were directors to sea level. And about, I, you know, um, depending on how you define those those things, it can be a bit difficult when you're looking at job descriptions to know. But so it's quite a senior base. Um, and it, one of the interesting things I would say before going to any of the results was compared to May and, uh, you know, the survey results I saw then, there were much less differences, much fewer differences between different groups of respondents. The sample size is not really big enough to draw out any main conclusions from that. But just on what people were saying and the general direction of the numbers, I would say there's been a slightly, you know, slightly more homogenous response to things. So what we're looking at are the total numbers and there are differences regionally, but the, the differences that we saw are not, not enormous. This has all gone to a, a report that we published last week. Um, we called it Ready for the Crunch. The point of the crunch is to say, after the crisis, things are going to change again. And and what we're trying to say to folk is, don't just relax. Don't think it's all over, because there's a fun, in, in a way, there's a great opportunity once the crisis comes to an end, because everything changes again, everything accelerates again. And the crunch, in my mind, was a bit like when you're in a car and you've been on a long journey and you've been inching along and inching along and inching along. And then you put on the, your foot on the pedal and the car goes... <laughs> And, and I think that's the thing the industry has got to avoid. It's got to make sure it's ready to, to move fast um, in, into, into, uh, and to continue to move fast. So um, that's where it's come from. I'll just talk a little bit about the, what, did, what, what does it mean and, and also then the methodology. Because I was talking to Reiner about this last night and it was clear that explaining what the numbers mean is quite helpful uh, as a general principle. So what you can tell, we think, is like the landscape. And it helps, I think, to give you a picture of what people are thinking. So what you might encounter if you're out in your organization, what do people think or expect may change? But what it isn't is a, is a kind of benchmark for investment. You know, you can't say the investment's going to go up or down by this, but you can probably say, well, look, these are the areas that are more likely to get attention or you're more likely to get a positive reception in um, on these and less likely in these. So it's more about relative scores and things like that. And obviously there's the message from our sponsor, which in this case is me, which is, if you want to know more about it, come and talk to us. So um, that's the advert over. Um, so what was the approach we took? We approached, we said, this is fundamentally the question. What do you think are the most likely changes to telco activities or investments in the following areas in 2021 compared to 2020? So it's quite a broad question. And so don't answer the ones you don't take a view on. I also asked some questions about, do you think this is uh, an area you know a lot about? But actually people were pretty self-selecting. They only really answered ones they knew about. And then to make the results um, quick to consume in this format and the research we go into a lot more depth and looking at how many voted for each sort of type we've scored them so we said for the people who said hmm, let's say 5g is going to get a major acceleration budget lift or launch we've given them two points if they said it was a major delay or budget cut we've given them minus two points so we and if they said no change likely we give them zero so what we're trying to get is a sentiment score that says roughly you know where do you where do you see this in relation to uh, you know, your expectations. So this is the results and that's the link there to the survey. Uh, the previous link was to the report. So first point, uh, and I don't really, I mean, I don't really want to dwell too much on this, but in a, in a way this is obvious, but it was remarkable how much it was true, was how much confidence is returning to the industry um, between May 2020 and 20, January 21, because the first, when I started to look at the results, I was thinking, oh my God, what is this telling me? It's just, and really fundamentally, it was just telling me everybody's starting to feel more optimistic, and which is natural. It's understandable. We're at a stage, you know, we should, we'd painted out the scenarios. We said things are starting to look better. And if you're, if you're in the UK, it's full of people planning a party, basically for when lockdown lifts. And I think what that was making me feel is that there's a danger of a kind of relaxation I don't mean you shouldn't party, by all means party, by all means enjoy the freedoms that you recover. But I think from a commercial perspective, going back to this crunch point is to say, look, things are gonna speed up, things are gonna keep changing. Don't relax, don't relax your attention as party, but make sure you keep changing. Um, but again, I'm showing this because it has, it features in the results, you'll see that everything's improved or pretty much everything, it's increased in priority. So it's about, or, or how people rated that priority, the sentiment of it. So it's about keeping that in mind and saying it's really about the relative um, dimensions between the scores that you see. 
So yeah, I'm now uh, going to... Uh, uh, Andrew, I'll say it's probably worth also just sort of highlighting, you, you mentioned recency bias. There's all sorts of cognitive biases around familiarity, around um, knowledge and understanding. Um, yeah, it's, it's a sort of, it comes to, it's a bit like the sort of Kahneman type thinking fast and slow uh, behavioral and cognitive effects, which are overlaid onto the, the, uh, the, the detailed analytical landscape. I think that's true and that to some extent is always true of research and insight into anything. You have to try and think of the by the one that seemed to me the strongest in this one was recency. So in May we were thinking, oh my God, the world, not quite the world is going to end, but we had a very bleak outlook and now we have a more optimistic outlook. And we probably weren't as right as we thought we were in May as our scenario shot shows and we're probably not as right as we think we are not now. So I think that's the other kind of thing in here is to say there's no certainty in this, but what this is is about sentiment and how people are thinking and feeling as far as we see it. Um, so I'm going to get into the meat now, hopefully. Um, so this chart, just to describe it, is the top 10 scores. So, and they, the, the top scores are, as I described that weighting mechanism, transformation programs came out top, digital health second, um, I, I'm not going to read them all out. You guys can all read, and I'm not going to offend you with that sensibility. But what we're looking at here is we asked about 40 different areas. So these are the top 10. Um, and I realise 10 is quite a lot to look at, but you know, I was. What I'd like to do is just discuss this list with the panel now and just say, okay, what do we see here? Um, and just to open that, one of the conversations I started with Rainer yesterday when we were looking at this is you know, transformation is back in town. And my view on this, looking at the research, which was actually quite, in a way, I think similar to yours when we talked yesterday, was that the idea of transformation is changing. So if you ask someone five years ago, transformation was about a technological change. We'll stick some new you know, shiny bits or software or whatever into this part of the network and that's transformation. We're going to use this new software or we're going to go this route or that route. What I think reading the results, uh, reading into research and what I generally pick up, and again this is about temperature, is that what people mean is something different. It's about meaning make changing the way the business works and that people want the business to change. And it, this is true geographically and at different levels. Everybody wants the business to change the way it works. That's what it seemed to me. Um, but Rhonda, I'll, I'll pass it to you because you, you said some really interesting things about this yesterday. Yes, yeah, so I was. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. So I, I was uh, quite, um, uh, you know, I was quite uh, interested to see the the transformation as such to be in the top spot here in terms of the new research, um, and I think it 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 really supports the hypothesis I formulated earlier, which is to say that has the pandemic really changed the priorities or has it uh, just accelerated uh, the inevitable uh, change that is ahead? Uh, I think there can be a, there can be a, a view which I have is, is more the letter, which means that things um, accelerate uh, for good or bad. Uh, and it's about um, creating the future maybe in a faster way than we have uh, thought. And that's why I think having a transformation program, uh, it's, a, it's a broad term, but uh, having a transformation program to help accelerate change in, a, in an organized and sustainable way uh, does make a lot of sense, especially now. Uh, we, can, we can say this from a Telia company perspective, we have communicated our uh, strategy just in our Capital Markets Day uh, end of January recently and uh, certainly at the heart of what we are saying is uh, there's a number of changes uh, we come to that uh, around customer experience around digital operations lean and efficiency which all require a, a muscle uh, and a continuous you know transformation this is far more than a one-off this is far more than a than a cost-cutting exercise uh, this is also something that in reality will not go away. So what we are basically seeing, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, and again, through maybe beyond telco industry is that change will be become will become the new norm. So we as companies have to be getting ready for a continuous change, for a continuous improvement. And that requires a different way of operating. That requires a different way of, you know, faster experimentation, learning, 
you know, implementing change and continuously doing so rather than looking at this as a program which starts and then which stops and then we are basically arrived. So there is no point of arrival in the sense. So, so for me, this kind of uh, a change to become the new norm being reflected here in this uh, in, in the survey kind of uh, makes a lot of sense, Andrew, and um, uh, and of course underneath the change, then you can discuss what are the priorities that we have to change. Is it around customer experience? Is it around the way how we operate? Is it the way how we are running business models? Is it maybe new innovation areas? So all these things are coming, so to speak, underneath, and there may be different priorities different companies have. But I think the commonality is that the need for change and the need to implement a resilience. Uh, in in our companies going forward as the new norm. I think a word you thank you, Ron. A word you used yesterday, which I thought was really interesting, captured what I was saying a bit better, which was holistic. It, it, it's about holistic approach to change. And what I was fascinated in is that, that sense of two things you said there. One is no point of arrival, or in the sense that the point of arrival is continually moving. It is yeah. continual change. It is the ability to adapt and and learn. Yes, 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 exactly. So, so rather than having just um, having just one single view on a cost uh, or a takeout or having a single view on a new product launch, I think it's now about uh, looking at this uh, in a broad-based way. That the, the challenge, if you look at it now from an implementation perspective, needless to say, is now what are what is the sequencing and what is the approach that we are going to be taking? Because obviously, as companies, we have a limited set of things we can do at any point in time. So it's again about then the prioritization. And here, again, to the change and to the way of, of how we should be working, probably more is in, a, is in a more nimble, and I would call it agile way, which means that rather than running one single thing as a monolith, uh, it may be so that we have to kick off a number of speedboats uh, they are running more at the same time and we are scaling those speedboats into the organization so we have a concurrency of the activities uh, while of course we have at the same time to manage the entire portfolio in terms of uh, you know investment where do we invest where do we disinvest and to keep control of this overall portfolio of initiatives I think becomes also a key skill for us as companies which have a bit of a larger uh, operation than maybe if you are a, a younger company or a startup. So I think that this is the kind of the, the, the ecosystem that we see and I think different will probably differentiate the winners uh, and the losers going forward uh, in, in the marketplace. Interesting. Dean, what do you think? Oh, no, well, there's a few things that jump out at me. Um, First is, I'm very glad to see limited use of the word digital on here, which I hate. Um, but uh, more importantly, I think the transform having transformation is interesting because coupled with a few others, such as the innovation and development and understanding customer needs and market opportunities, um, these are very single operator and single telco considerations. Um, what isn't on this chart, and is perhaps conspicuous by its absence, is this idea that all telcos are the same and have to act in some form of templated, coordinated fashion, um, which I think has actually been a major stumbling block for the industry in the past, where there's this sort of temptation to sort of divide the world into a them and us, um, you know, where it's telcos versus everyone else. And I think here, there's much more internal focus on as an individual company, what needs to be done by operators to succeed, to come out of their particular circumstances with their particular network, their particular customer base, their particular political and epidemiological environment. Um, and that doesn't mean they can't coordinate, but it's mu much more focused on solutions to specific problems rather than hand-waving generalities. Um, a couple of other things that I'm pleased to see on there is I, I, quite, I was surprised how high the consumer security services uh, are, and that might be reflective of you know, general concern around things like privacy at the moment, uh, which obviously is, is coming to the fore. Um, marginal amount of difference, but fiber being higher than 5G is unsurprising given the amount of time that people are spending at home, and also the balance of focus uh, of uh, some of the, the government. Uh, national broadband plans, depending on where the 
um, the makeup of the uh, respondents come from is, is obviously going to vary a bit. Um, and I'm certainly pleased to see this. The, uh, the understanding customer needs and market opportunities, I think, is something I'm seeing in my engagements. And I'm, I'm seeing much more medium to long term vision on um, you know, what does the future look like in terms of the consumer, in terms of enterprises, in terms of wholesale models, in terms of partnerships with new categories of companies, whether that's hyperscale uh, cloud providers or uh, enterprise solution vendors. So, yeah, I, I, I think that the, the, there's, a, there's positivity, but I also think that it's focused on, on the specifics of individual companies rather than a perception of the telecom industry yeah, in sort of broad. In, in broad. Yeah, if I may, may add to this, Dean, I, I agree, and, and I'm not sure whether this has been a question, um, Andrew, that was asked or not, but I, I think there is an element of the individual program and there's an element of uh, wider shifts and changes and certainly one change that that I see uh, more pronounced than ever is what you could call a kind of a decomposition or a modularization um, of um, elements uh, which relate to now also the IT side of our industry rather than the network side of our industry to be more and more um, de facto standardized through APIs so that we can actually start to work with our partners uh, or even um, across a different industry players uh, on the telco side um, uh, much more flexible than ever before. So plugging together components, whether open source or not, through let's uh, through to through APIs such as the TM Forum standard standards uh, initiative, which we are quite in favor of, is 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 a bit newer not completely new, a bit newer, and I think helps us to be, uh, you know, in the sense of what I was trying to say, more flexible and, and more nimble and faster in, in service creation, service composition, testing, and also, um, you know, uh, scaling innovation rather than only doing it ourselves with partners. So, so this element, I think, uh, Dean, I, I fully agree. It is there, uh, uh, whether it's strong enough it can be debated, but it is there and it, I see it stronger than in the past years, certainly on the IT side as well. While the network side also has the interesting shifts, which again is not on this list here, where we see also a decomposition of the previously completely siloized network elements into a much more open interfacing, which has its own challenges. Uh, there are of course proponents and there are more conservative people out there in the market, both on the telco as well as on the service, on the network equipment manufacturing side, but uh, there are changes as well. That we see again yet another decomposition of elements which gives a lot of opportunity uh, if you do it right. I think yeah. one thing that's also that, that, that overlays what you just said about openness is the, the sort of the, the slight shadow cast by the governmental and policy making world over a lot of this as well and, and how much of what the industry is doing is is either is in response to you know external pressures and then also now you see for example in europe where a lot of the operators are trying to get a slice of the sort of recovery funds for example i mean you could argue that maybe the telecoms industry is, is not in as bad a position as hospitality or travel in terms of getting money but you know the, handing out checks. I suspect everyone wants to be in the queue. I think this is a good time to bring up one of the questions we've got from the audience where um, someone has asked, isn't one of the big lessons learned that you need a compelling event like the COVID pandemic in order to drive forward this accelerated change? Would you guys agree with that or what's your view? Um. I remember actually hearing one time uh, is it John Chambers, who used to be Cisco CEO, saying market transitions wait for nobody. And I think that 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 really resonated with me. And, and, and so market transitions can, can come about as a result of external factors, um, you know, such as the pandemic or political change, or it can be internal factors, a generational change in technology, for example. Yeah. So certainly you do have, um, you know, whether you want to call it a catalyst, whether you want to call it a discontinuity, clearly it provokes it provokes reorganization of the industry and, and realignment. Yeah, but you know, coming back to your point, Reiner, about the kind of you know disaggregation we're seeing in different parts of the business, if COVID had happened five years ago, that technology step change wouldn't have been ready to to arrive anyway in telecom. So that 
I mean, from my perspective, it's a combination of factors. Yeah, I, I think uh, the question is is in line with with what I what I was um, uh, indicating before that I think the event uh, and there may there will be other such events coming uh, in the future uh, in what hopefully not as bad as as we see it now, but. Uh, catalysts that are accelerating trends. Uh, like I said, I don't think it's actually changing that much what the direction would have been anyways. It's just compressing changes that would have happened maybe in five years into one year. If you look at the um, online capabilities that I think some of the telcos don't really uh, <laughs> Uh, embrace uh, um, uh, enough. If you look at the online penetration, if you look at the online acquisition, the customer care through self-care applications, all these things are so so obvious that we need to that we need to have them. But in terms of the prominence of the uh, the investments uh, and also the quality of how we are now serving, it's been just it's now a different world than 12, 12 24 months ago. On the internal operation as well, in terms of how are people working, what is the flexibility in terms of the workforce, what are the tools and the processes, what is the level of automation, all of these things would have to happen anyways, but they're just now so much compressed in a in a way in a, in a positive in a positive you uh, know way, which uh, gives us better quality to the customers, uh, but also a better cost base to reinvest into the future, such as 5G, which I think is another point, Andrew, that you may be coming to, which is has come up in Europe uh, a lot higher now in the research as compared to half a year ago or a year ago. Yeah, I, I mean, I, sorry, I just want to pick up on something. Um, we, we'll talk about some of the things you mentioned, Rainer, in a minute about the APIs and the cloud stuff, because they're, they're in the list. They're just... I think the perception I had was people felt they weren't going to accelerate, they had, al they had already accelerated. So they, they were still going forward and they were going forward more positively, but these were the ones on the top. So it's not they've been neglected, it's just an order question. Sorry, Amy, cut across you. Yeah, it was just before we moved on to the next topic, I wanted to kind of circle back to that transformation subject that we were talking about before and that you know the sort of holistic transformation and that you know we're moving you know it's it's thinking about how to do this at, at a higher level across many different parts of the organization towards an ongoing goal and you know if we look at the digital health solutions which the industry is you know you know second highest after transformation solutions I think that different mindset about what transformation is will really help to make a successful play for those that are looking at the healthcare market, because everyone, you know, every industry is going through that change of mindset of what transformation means for them and what they are trying to achieve. And so I, I think that combination of thinking differently about what transformation is, really prioritizing, understanding what the customer needs is, what, what are they trying to achieve in the way that they're operating? You know, they, they don't want necessarily just a point solution that they can monitor a patient. They, they want something that's going to, you know, transform the whole patient journey or the whole workflow journey. And, and so I think that telcos changing the way they think will help to understand better the needs of the different industries that they might be seeking to build business in. Yeah, and the, and the complementing aspect, Amy, if you wish, uh, is looking at the other way around from the consumer or the enterprise thoughts who would be the partner that i choose for my service uh, if i look at health uh, or if i look at ict services um, uh, such as in the security space as also is here on the list uh, what we see at least is that there is a certain element of trust and a certain element of stability and continuity um, and quality and even service which becomes uh, ever more important. So if I choose a healthcare provider in terms of digital health, if I choose um, my ICT provider for my um, security service uh, in combination maybe with connectivity and data center services, whom am I turning to? And we see there is an element of uh, reinforcing, I think, a certain a quality level and a player that has a certain presence in the market and a certain brand and service um, you know, promise that is fulfilled more than ever before, uh, and that obviously is is um, is helpful for people that have uh, that have a certain market uh, presence today. We see also that um, those um, players and as Telia company, we are certainly playing in this um, domain. Um, you know, having an integrated portfolio of core services that can be 
with uh, own service creation or can be through partners and providing this portfolio uh, to the customer is, is, is an incremental value rather than having um, only the option to cherry pick, which obviously always is the case as well. So especially on the digital health, obviously there are uh, point solutions, uh, many of them from very innovative companies, uh, but we do see there is also a point of providing an integrated uh, suite, uh, which then has uh, you know, different um, devices which are measuring different um, important um, uh, uh, signals from, from my health or from the elderly person's health, aggregating them into uh, an integrated application and providing that to the patient as well as to the doctor if the patient wishes to do so. So this is, for example, one specific area we also as Telia Company we are invested in and maybe tomorrow if you talk to Annette, she will be able to give you a lot more uh, detail on this health uh, service portfolio, which I agree as a, as a, as a, as an area is, is, is highly on the agenda and um, uh, it might be coming as a bit of a surprise that as a telecommunication provider we'd be playing in this field, but it comes back to the level of trust and the level of you know, being there in the local market also with local regulation yeah. uh, uh, may be an argument for choosing a telco rather than um, just a, a point solution. Thank you. I think uh, to move us um, on to the, there's a couple more slides that are worth having a quick look at because they cover more points. Um, so this this chart is one that shows the changes. So remember it kind of added up the scores. Well, there were some questions. I did, some of the questions changed, but I, these are the ones that I was able to compare from the questions we asked in May and the questions we asked in January. And so what you can see at the top of that list is 5G absolutely exploded in terms of uh, prioritization. Now, I think part of the reason for that is, um, well, two things I'd, I'd draw attention to. One is the way I asked the question included tests and pilots and launches, whereas before it just talked about investment uplift. So I think it was slightly easier to answer the question. So that probably favored 5G and some of the other things on this list. But having said that, the scale of the movement is so confident and so positive that it, it's not a sort of question artifact. It is, it is a clear change. I think the other thing that's really interesting here is age, how age has come up on this list. From, and um, of the other things, where 5G recruitment and sustainability were actually net negative in May. So the net sentiment was, well, it's probably going to stay the same, if not go down in May. And now people are saying, no, we need to get back on these agendas. And so re recruitment and I suppose the recruitment and sustainability, not so much of a surprise because clearly, you know, you can't stop recruiting forever. And typically when you have market shocks, you stop and then you start again. And that's kind of what we're seeing some of. And sustainability, I think, is because of the changing agenda. You know, people, the, the COVID crisis has forced people to think about actually, you know, what bad things can happen. These sort of large shocks and, and large changes are a part of, of the world we see. And therefore, that's come back on the agenda. But um, I, I'm opening it back to, to you guys to say what you know, when you look at this list, what do you think? What do you think about the 5G number? Oh, the other thing I should add to that is, as Ryan had pointed out, I think a large part of that comes from Europe. Again, the sample's not quite big enough to be absolutely certain, but it's quite a big sample of people who are very educated, you know, very informed, you know, it was the way I would look at it. So while the sample size is not huge, the level of the change in it was quite significant, I think. And I feel that Europe is starting to be more positive about 5G, but I'm not sure how much. You know, and, and I'm not sure that there's a little bit of doubt around the business case and that, yes, but we, we can see it's really important when we've got back into the, yes, we can see consumers important. Yes, we can see providing coverage and stuff is important, but I'm not quite sure about the business case yet. That's sort of generally the feeling I got from it. So apologies for being a bit vague about loose about that. But I welcome your views, Dean, Amy, Ryan, and what do you think? I'd, I'd say there's a couple of things that have obviously changed over the last 10 months or so. The, I mean, the first is, yeah, I think that there was a big, downward swing in 5G priority at the beginning of the pandemic because it clearly wasn't a priority. Nobody had devices um, and no one really knew where the economy was going on the pandemic. So there was a lot more emphasis on making sure the 4G network work, the transport and, and core networks work, fixed networks work. And now that we, they're all more predictable. Even if there are subsequent waves of the pandemic, we know where that's going. So you can go back to 5G. But the other thing is that in the meantime, 5G, well, first off in Europe, a number of countries have hold, held spectrum auctions or awards, uh, which means that investment can actually go ahead, whereas previously it couldn't have done. Um, second thing is the um, uh, more devices, especially the iPhone 
uh, 5G support from uh, October last year has made this into a, if you like, it, it, that's the hurdle to get to the sort of upper part of the mass market, I think. Some interest around fixed wireless access up to a point as well in some places. Um, yeah, and, and sort of getting back on track from where we were. And the other thing I would say on the, on the technology side is dynamic spectrum sharing has become much more viable. Um, and so people are aware that they can reuse their existing 4G bands for 5G. So I think there's a bunch of technology sides to this as well as the, the sort of greater levels of certainty around pandem pandemic and economy. Yeah, so uh, I I, uh, I would add uh, a deem to to the five G point. Um, we have seen in uh, in Europe, uh, uh, especially in the Nordics here in in, in Italia company footprint, uh, a, a, an extreme uh, forefront uh, in innovation leadership. Um, uh, so we have based on this one even seen that our four G networks have come to age and what we are doing now is that rather than looking at only the 5G we actually are modernizing in, in line with what you said is that in dynamic spectrum sharing and the ability to more flexibly allocate the resources between 4 and 5G we are modernizing now the, the networks uh, for 4G at the same time upgrading them to the 5G in a very standardized uh, way with like standard site types that we are that we are doing so the efficiency of of going from from 4G to 5G actually is is a lot better in terms of the business case. In addition, what we see is um, an actual market upswing of the ARPU. For example, in Finland, where we have launched a 5G and we see uh, a, a very positive, uh, very positively, uh, an ARPU increase um, for the customers that are then uh, having a 5G device and going to the 5G network. And in addition to this, what we also see is obviously, needless to say, that. I have always been a fan of the fixed wireless business, uh, complementing the fiber, and uh, we, we see the fixed wireless that we have launched early on 4G. Now we are also complementing uh, with a 5G coverage uh, is, is extremely high on the agenda now for our customers and also some of the some of the enterprises, um, the smaller enterprises to connect um, to to connect to the internet, even if they're not covered by um, uh, a fiber footprint. So all of this um, in terms of Driving 5G clearly is 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 in favor of of this point of having 5G now back on the agenda um, uh, here in Europe. Uh, and maybe what what I wanted to to reflect on this recruitment point, uh, I think that is related to some of the topics that are on this list here. Because if I look at the major shifts that we are seeing in the industry, uh, again no new, but accelerated through uh, through the last uh, 12 uh, months. The uh, the cloud uh, and the embracement of the public cloud um, and the um, you know cloudification even on the network side, uh, going uh, not only into virtual uh, but also into containerized environment, and also the use of AI at some uh, finally at some point in our industry to not only do the uh, better customer offers but also to to work smarter in terms of our operation. This all requires um, a, quite a shift on the workforce side from. Uh, what we have done previously into some of some of the skills that we don't really have uh, at, at sufficient numbers and sufficient quality yet in our organization. So there is a need to really address this um, uh, the skill gap. The way how we do this also is uh, uh, we are looking in um, uh, in a way across the different geographies uh, uh, in our footprint. So rather than looking at only a domestic uh, a hiring strategy. We see that, for example, the nearshoring uh, strategy that we have um, is very, very beneficial to us. We have about a thousand people um, now delivering those high-value services, IT, uh, and other shared services to the to the group um, from a nearshoring location completely captively, and that is actually uh, coming coming along very, very well. So addressing the workforce gap through training and through having the um, uh, uh, the workforce on shore, but also complementing it with a nearshoring uh, strategy has um, has really helped a lot and has also accelerated over the past 12 months, I would say. Interesting. I think there's the, you know, this is a good time to bring in another question that we've had from the audience, which is why is sustainability carbon reduction so low down? And I guess the, the person asking it might be a little bit surprised because it's been a very hot topic um in in the news and around you know 5g using lots of energy and how do how are we going to manage that so what are what is everyone's thoughts on on why that's not higher 
I, I think it is pretty high actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and notable, this is the biggest increases in priority. So this isn't all of them. This presumably there's a whole bunch of others which didn't make the cut to be included on this yeah. slide. Um, yeah, this has changed, and also the, I mean this is the change since May. So the change in outlook since May. So it's almost yeah. like the change on top of the change. Whereas and and so it's not absolute prioritisation, but I think so. You could argue. That sustainability is incredibly high, and uh, and etc. And 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 my gut feel, yeah, in the words it is, but in the actions it isn't. Would be my my sense. I just don't think it's what's in people's mind. I don't, Rainer, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, comment on that. I think it's too difficult. Um, because well, I can comment. Uh, no, 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 no issue at all. Because the the. I think there has been a change. Uh, what, what I see, uh, where previously, at least concerning again, uh, Telia company, and not speaking for for everyone else, but we, we we see now that sustainability is a complete integral part of our strategy and execution, as compared to having sustainability as an appendix. So, so that may be a change. Uh, it, we are probably not unique uh, in this one, but for us, it's clear that across our strategy which is around providing digital experiences providing an excellent connectivity transforming to digital and delivering results and all of these four pillars of our strategy uh, the, the sustainability is completely ingrained with uh, clear kpis and with clear measures as part of the integral transformation program that we are running so i think that may be something noteworthy rather than being some, something separate. It, it is now part of what we do in each and every of uh, the, let's say, go-to-market products uh, initiatives or internal way of working or choices we make with partners all have uh, a sustainability angle to it. Right? So, so, so I, I say well, what Dean is saying, so for me, this is fairly high. It, it can be higher, but as you say, uh, Andrew, it's not an absolute ranking. Uh, it is almost like saying this is not something on the side which is a, which is a separate topic it is an integral part of the way how we work almost like a value that we have in terms of how we work the sustainability is part and parcel of what, what we are doing mm. uh, i think it would be I really inter my, interesting my to have survey is... cfos as well because i think i think that the, the it's rapidly um, sustainability is rapidly riding up the financial agenda because there's a growing move in financial markets to have more standardized reporting um, and actually for you know buy side investors to scrutinize their um, their shareholdings in terms of um, their carbon performance for example and i think that's something we can expect to see increasingly is leverage from the financial investor side as much as sort of if you like internally generated uh, from operators I just want to give everyone a heads up. We've got two minutes left, so we're going to need to wrap up, wrap up soon. So maybe we'll get start getting our final comments in. And I'll just start with a quick one by saying that the one that we haven't talked about on this list is Telco Edge, which I remember when we first did this survey, we were thinking, oh, you know, like no one's really, you know, this way or that way on Edge, even though we knew it was a topic that people were interested in, they didn't really have an opinion. So it's interesting to see that it's come up the list a lot. And I won't pretend to be the expert here. I'll just say that join us on Thursday and you'll find out why it's gone up. Yeah, I just to add to that, I mean, so the two next seminars, the one that, uh, webinar, sorry, the one that Amy's running tomorrow is about the new opportunities. So thinking about things like healthcare and, uh, and, and other uh, adjacent opportunities for telcos as well as the existing ones and the one on Thursday which Dania is running at 10, 10 uh, GMT is about 5G and edge so it's very much more on the technical angle and all kind of kind of cover some of the cloud angles so we deliberately well not deliberately but we haven't been really focused on the technology stuff today we've been talking about the high level stuff so that was the game plan just to conclude this is map I tried to draw out trying to conclusions because it's sort of to, to try and go back to conversation with Reiner about priorities. There's not absolute priorities. It's about the movement of priorities. And so this lays out on the on the on the vertical axis, you know, which which were the in the other in the upper or lower half of the listing. So in, increasing or, or or less increasing for the most part. And the ones um, 
sort of right to left are the ones of how much they increased compared to uh, May. So the top right are the ones who are high, who were high priorities and got even higher. So you've got transformation in there. You've got 5G, fiber, all those services. An interesting edge, we, education. We haven't had time to talk about that and AI, but I think we've, we've covered those things. I put in a box I called the rising stars, things like Telco Edge uh, and these other, going back to what you were saying about the API interfaces and the cloudification. I think that some of this stuff is definitely in the rising star list. It's it's something that's growing in priority, but it's not not kind of at the top of people's minds at the moment, but it's top of some people's minds. The top left are the ones which are were high priorities and have stayed high priorities. They haven't, so they didn't have much room to increase in a lot of cases, like digital health didn't, and security services, for example. And then the bottom left are ones who I labeled as relatively mature niche early or declining because there's a risk of saying, oh, these ones are bad. They're not bad. What they typically are are ones that are occupying either a smaller part of people's attention or they may be mature. So something like the 4G mobile, mobile network, which came down the bottom, is a mature thing. So it's not going to receive increasing attention or, or, or changes. I think there's a logic to it. And But I think there are some other questions there. We don't really have time to go into that. The research talks about this some some depth, but that was to try and give you a map of the overall picture. Um, so Amy, I'm gonna hand back to you and I think we should, is there any other yeah, questions I, we can take? I, I don't think we have time for other questions because we're over time. So really just a big thank you to Reiner and Dean for joining us today and for all your thoughts. Um, it's been, it's been a, great, a great discussion, thank you. Thank you very Great. much, guys. Bye, Bye James. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.